بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله وأعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له هو رب العالمين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله إمام المتقين ورسول رب العالمين الذي بعث إلى الأحمر والأسود والذي تركنا على المحجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك صلى الله وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فاتقوا الله عباد الله واتقوا يوما ترجعون فيه إلى الله ثم توفى كل نفس ما كسبت وهم لا يظلمون We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We thank him upon all conditions We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and to grant us goodness in this world and the next we send complete blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household and all his companions. May Allah bless them all. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve our offspring and may he make us from amongst those who are protected from shaitan. May he make us from amongst those who earn paradise and who can be a reason that our children by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also be granted paradise. My brothers and sisters in Islam, it is important for us to understand the benefit of charity. When we say sadaqah, we normally refer to that which is monetary. When a person says, why don't you give out a charity? We normally speak to one another referring to that which is monetary. So you will give out a few dollars, a few rupees, a few rands, a few pounds, and we will perhaps think that I have been charitable. I have given out a charity. But what we do need to understand is Islam has not only kept the term charity within that which is monetary. It goes far deeper than that. So much so that even my character will be considered a charitable deed if I were to do something based on good character and conduct. Similarly, if I were to smile, the hadith speaks of tabassumuka fi wajhi akhika sadaqah. The smile that you will actually have that smile that you make yourself break into in the face of your brother is a charitable deed for many reasons. One is it uplifts the moods. It actually presents an opportunity to reconfirm the brotherhood that we have and so on. So many reasons. So it is called a charitable deed. Similarly, if I were to reach out to assist a person doing anything good, it would actually be considered a charitable deed or a deed of sadaqah. However, from these deeds, you will find clearly that there are two types of the charities. One is a charity that will start where you started it and end exactly where you ended it. So if I were to smile at you, it's a beautiful charity, mashallah. It's an act of worship. I will be receiving and achieving rewards for it. But at the same time, when I stop smiling, it stops. It's cut. So as soon as I smiled, it started. And when I stop, it cut. And the same applies, for example, if I were to give a piece of bread to someone, mashallah, it is a charitable deed. But as they received it, I received a reward for it. And as they ate it and it went, subhanallah, my reward has stopped at that point, not to say it was nullified, not to say it was decreased, but that is the amount of reward I received for that particular charity. Just like when I'm investing, for example, when I go into the shop and I buy something for myself to eat, yes, I will pay the money, I will receive something and I will consume it. And once I've consumed it, it's over. The money is gone and the item is gone. It's finished. But there are certain types of spendings or the, the expenditure, or should I say how I use my money can also benefit me in the long term. So for example, if I have X amount and I go to the market and I buy a little bit with it and I sell that product and I make a little bit more money and then I come back and go to the market and buy more and come back 
and I would perhaps sell it once again and make even more money until my business grows. That is one type of business. But there is another type of easy business. What is it? Those who have the wealth, perhaps I will buy a building. And if I buy the building, I will keep on receiving revenue for a long, long time. And if I were to die, my children will receive revenue. I hope they don't fight, inshallah, over the building. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness. But at the same time, what I need to understand is, it is a gift of Allah to be able to do that. Not everyone can do that. So similarly in Islam, the Sharia teaches us that there are certain deeds that are, yes, charitable. But if the benefit of it continues, so will the reward. Subhanallah. So if I have an opportunity, for example, to drill a borehole, what will happen? I spent the money, but did the money cut off at a certain point? No, the water kept coming and it kept coming even after I died. And so after I died, whoever's drinking from it, I'm still receiving a reward for it, just like I would had it been a building that continued, you know, achieving the revenue even after I died. So this is the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us. What we need to consider for a moment is just like when we have some wealth and we go to the expert to ask the expert that you know what, how best can I use this wealth so that I can receive maximum uh, from it? You know, the return will be maximum. And then you have these financial experts who will tell you that you know what, if you put your money here, you may lose it. If you put it here, there is a risk involved. And if you put it here, it is much better for you. Perhaps there is a risk because there will always be a risk but at the same time there is a greater chance of this thing continuing and you receiving much more similarly it's up to us to go to those who know the, the religion and the deen and to ask them look I want to give out a charity what is the best way of me doing it let me give you an example from the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu he got a, a piece of land prime land in Khaybar and what did he do? When he got this land, he went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, O oh Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I have got prime land in Khaybar. What should I do with it? Subhanallah. Imagine going to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to ask, What should I do with this land? I've got a nice piece of land somewhere. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him or explained to him the concept of waqf or endowment and explained to him what you should do is. The, the land is held in an endowment such that the benefit of it will continue to uh, sections of people that you will choose as the one who has made that endowment known as a waqif. So he decided, okay, uh, this land, the benefit of it will go to the poor and the relatives and whoever else he stipulated. And from this, we learn something great and that is to seek advice. You want to maximize on the profits or the benefits, both religious as well as monetary. You need to ask the experts. That is something important and then follow what is being said or at least take that advice seriously. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to seek the advice of the right people in the, in the right field, the field of the matter that we would like advice in. Now, if we take a look at this, the benefit of it continued even after Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was martyred. You know, he was obviously martyred and after that, what happened is the benefit continued. The same applies with us. If we go back to the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, which appears in Sahih Muslim, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, إِذَا مَاتَ بْنُ آدَمَ إِنْ قَطَعَ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثِ If the son of Adam, which means a human being, passes away, his deeds are all cut, they are cut off, except three things. What are these three things? I need to know because Yes, I will fulfill my salah, I will read the Quran, I will do good deeds as best as I can. And we all know that your books are closed once you die and now your deeds are being registered. But there are certain types of deeds that will continue up to the end of time for as long as the benefit of what you've done continues. So that is extremely good for us in terms of benefit, very beneficial. What are these deeds? I need to know them. I really need to know them because once I know them, I will make it my duty to try my best to engage in one of them, if not all of them. Subhanallah. So three types of deeds that will remain. After I die, I continue getting the reward of it. May Allah protect us. May He grant us goodness and not evil because some people do evil deeds 
And what happens is the hadith explains that if that evil continues, in that case they will receive a sin of whatever has been resultant evil committed by others instigated by the initial person. So if I were to teach you something really bad and then I die, may Allah protect us. I would receive a sin of what you've done because I've taught you. If I was not connected to it, obviously Allah says, وَلَا تَزِرُوا وَازِرَةٌ وِزْرَ أُخْرَى No soul shall bear the burden of another. Never. Except if you are connected to that. So if it's goodness and you are connected to it, you receive good. If it is evil and you are connected to it, you receive evil. Or you will be answerable. Like the hadith says, مَنْ سَنَّ سُنَّةً سَيِّئَةً فَلَهُ وِزْرُهَا وَوِزْرُ مَنْ عَمِلَ بِهَا إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ لَا يَنْقُصُ ذَلِكَ مِنْ أَوْزَارِهِمْ شَيْءٍ We've heard this hadith, I'm sure, so many times. Whoever sets a bad example will receive the sin of having done that and anyone who follows it up to the day of judgment from that source, the source will receive the sin of it because they were the source of it. May Allah protect us from it. And Allah says, the, the, everyone in the chain of the evil will receive their share of the, the sin. So similarly, when it comes to goodness, I need to make sure that what I've done is not evil. What I've done is good and it will return to me with a lot of goodness by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first thing mentioned in the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he says quite clearly, Sadaqatun jariyah, which means a charity. Not any old ordinary charity, but that which is jariyah. What is the meaning of jariyah? That which is flowing or continuing. It flows. I'm gone, but what I did, the benefit of it continues. So you establish a school, for example, you will perhaps die. In fact, you have to, and so will I. But if that school teaches goodness and continues for hundreds of years, centuries sometimes, by the will of Allah, you will achieve a great reward. Imagine, this is why the hadith says, Man lillahi masjidan, banallahu lahu baytan fil jannah. Whoever builds for Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, a house, the hadith did not say Mambana Masjidan Lillah, but it says Mambana Lillahi Masjidan. Whoever builds for the sake of Allah a house, because the intention when building a house of Allah is of utmost importance. It could actually make or break what is about to happen. So if you have an evil intention, you won't get a reward. In fact, a masjid that is built in order to split the Muslims has been termed in the Quran as a harmful masjid. Allahu Akbar. May Allah protect us. But masajid that are built for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the hadith says, for such a person, Allah will build a house in paradise. Allah will build a house in paradise. A lot of us here, perhaps we would never be able to afford to build an entire masjid on our own. So at least contribute with one brick. At least contribute with a small amount to the house of Allah. There are boxes that are sitting sometimes for the maintenance of the house of Allah. Let us be generous to put in a rupee or two or whatever small amount we can. Come and offer your assistance in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That will act as a sadaqatun jariyah because the benefit of that wealth will be used for the upkeep of the house of Allah. Do you think Allah is subhanahu wa ta'ala is only going to give you one brick in return? No. He will multiply your reward so time that so many times that perhaps you will have an entire house in paradise solely because you contributed with one brick. Subhanallah. Imagine if I had one brick in a home and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala witnesses that this brick has been donated by such and such a person with such a good heart. Do you really think that I'm only going to get one brick in Jannah and I will have the brick, this is your brick, and take it and go? The mercy of Allah is far greater than that. The gift of Allah is far greater than that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at your ability and He looks at your sincerity together with the contribution you have made. This is why if you go back to the hadith where during the battle of Tabuk, just before the battle of Tabuk, the people had to come in with their charities. You find some people came in with large quantities of wealth, whereas others came in with large percentage of what they owned. Very big difference between the two. Sometimes a person might donate a million rupees. For him, that was just 0.001% of what he has. And another man might donate 50,000 rupees, and that would be 50% of what he has. In the eyes of Allah, the latter has donated far more generously than the former. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So a man came with half a 
measurement or a measurement, one measurement of dates. And some of the hypocrites were laughing and scoffing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ يَلْمِزُونَ الْمُطَّوِّعِينَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فِي الصَّدَقَاتِ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَجِدُونَ إِلَّا جُهْدَهُمْ فَيَسْخَرُونَ مِنْهُمْ سَخِرَ اللَّهُ مِنْهُمْ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Those who mock at the others who have come, those who make a mockery or who try and joke and laugh at those who are charitable from them, themselves, who've come with a small amount, whatever they have found, whatever they have struggled and worked for, and they have brought it to present for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who mock at these type of people, Allah will make a mockery of them, and for them is a severe punishment. Never mock the amount that someone is giving. You don't know the sincerity that lies behind that donation. You don't know the condition of the person. You don't know how much they might have toiled and struggled in order to gather such a such an amount and we are making a mockery of it. May Allah protect us. This is why when that man came in, what he did, he had nothing to present. And the previous day when he heard that the mu'mineen were gathering wealth, he decided to work the entire day. He worked the whole day, hard work. At the end of the day, he received a certain amount in payment. He took half for his family and he gave half to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam in order to gather for the need that they had. Imagine 50% of whatever he had was gone. So compare that to someone who's donated a larger amount but smaller percentage. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who understand. So the, these type of narrations, they are encouraging us to give and donate no matter how, how much it is, but with a correct heart and to try and look for that need which is the greatest and the best. Sometimes there is an amount we have in terms of sadaqah or charity that we need to give. And we just look at the next place and we donate it. No, in Islam, think carefully. Look at the best possible place that you can put your wealth. Because obviously, the better the place, the greater the reward, the greater the chances of that reward following through. Like the hadith says, sadaqatun jariya. It doesn't just say sadaqah. Sadaqah would mean a charity. But jariya means that which is flowing on, that which continues even after your death. So we've given an example of a school, of a masjid, and perhaps even just a contribution towards it. A drilling a borehole, for example. We've already spoken about that. Planting a tree. Nobody can tell me that they cannot do that. Plant a fruit tree or a tree that provides shade. Not a cactus. Allahu Akbar. You know, don't plant something that is going to cause harm to the people. Obviously, unless it's a security wall around your, your premises, maybe. In some nations, they would use that as security. But generally, it is beneficial to plant that which provides shade and which provides fruit. Whether it is a bird, an animal or a human being who will achieve from it. Trust me, the hadith says you will continue to receive a reward even after you have died for as long as the tree remains. The day the tree is cut off, that's the day your reward slices. Not because anything bad happened, but that's what Allah chose and you had tried your best, it continued to the day. Inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us uh, the ability to use our wealth in the right direction and or every capacity that he has given us, inshallah, in the right direction. So. This is as far as a tree goes, the, the fruit goes and so on. Now, if you look at the second part of the hadith, it's connected to the first. So there are three things that will continue after you've died. The first we said, Sadaqatun Jariya, the charity which is uh, continuing or flowing after you've died. And I've given you a few examples, but there are so many other examples that inshallah, we will speak about in a few moments. The second part of the hadith says, Ilmun yuntafa'u bih. Knowledge that is being benefited from, that was left behind by the person who passed away. Their reward will continue even after they have passed away. So if I taught you how to read Quran, if I taught you something good, and the scholars have spoken of two types of knowledge, that knowledge which is religious, which is connected to your link between you and Allah, that is definitely there. But even the knowledge that is connected to the worldly life, that is beneficial, 
is also included in that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefit us. Some scholars have said, look, this is solely and only the, the, the religious part of it. But if you teach people, for example, uh, how to earn a living and how to protect themselves in a nation and so on, and the laws and how to handle themselves, that will definitely be beneficial. They will teach the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. Subhanallah. May Allah make us from amongst those who can teach one another. And may Allah make us from amongst those whom when the next generation learns from us, they can continue teaching others what they have learned. So if a person teaches how to read the Quran, the one who taught that person to read the Quran will also receive the reward. And the one who taught the person who taught the person will also receive a reward until it goes back to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nabiullah azza wa jal, the greatest of the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the highest of creation. Look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for him. Everything, including our presence today here, this Friday, this Jumu'ah, including our presence here, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam receives a full reward of the goodness we've engaged in because he was chosen to teach it to us. Subhanallah. So his reward is multiplied so much that nobody can compete with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa No one, never, ever. Subhanallah. But the bad that is done by us, he is free from it because he never ever taught us to do bad. Subhanallah. Look at this. So it is a reward that is being achieved. However, anyone who goes to learn from it and teaches others will also receive an equal reward. And they will continue receiving a reward for anyone whom they have taught, who teaches others and so on. This is amazing. It is something unique. It is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make us from those who learn and who teach. This is why one narration, the Prophet sallallahu clearly says, Khayrukum man ta'allam al-Qur'ana wa'allamahu. The best from amongst you, those who have learned the Qur'an and taught it. The best. You cannot compete with that person. So one might ask, what does it mean? It means all disciplines connected to the Quran. Everything, not only the recitation, that's included, but not only that. The recitation, the perfection of the recitation, yes. The memorization and the perfection of it, yes. The translation and the perfection of it, yes. The tafsir and the deeper explanation and the perfection of it, yes. And continuing. So look at how deep it is. Extraction of rules and how and why it was done. And when it was done and the, the, the principles governing the extraction of the rules and so on. The knowledge of the Quran goes so deep that it leads you to the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa It leads you to so much more. And it is something that will definitely benefit you. This morning, subhanallah. I had a discussion with one of my brothers and he was telling me something so important regarding the Sadaqatun Jariya, regarding a charity that is flowing or that will flow, that will continue, continuous charity. And he was saying, you know, when we walk, subhanallah, say I were to walk right now and as I'm walking, there is a huge pit in front of me and I don't realize that there is a pit in front of me and I'm walking so quick and I'm distracted by this thing and that thing. Next thing I know, I've dropped into the pit. Drop into the pit and dead. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Guess what? That's exactly what happens to us. We are walking in this world. We have distractions. We have so many things. On this side, we have aerodynamic vehicles and on the other side, we have aerodynamic women. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and ease. We have so many things on either side that distract us. Allahu Akbar. So many things. And what happens as a result? We don't see the pit that's in front of us. Next thing we drop, dead. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who utter the shahada as the last words before we die. Ameen. Now, wouldn't it be beneficial for us to prepare for that day by doing something such that when we get to the afterlife, we have got an investment that's there for us. Allahu Akbar. Today, people are so worried about setting up their children and their children's future that they forget to set up their own future. This is something that we need to think about. I'm setting up my children. I bought a house for each one of my children. I'm so concerned about my child and my daughter and my son. And I've set them all up and they all have their businesses. But what did you do? Oh, well, I'm so happy I set them. Did you set yourself? Question. Let's think about it. How do you set yourself? By engaging in sadaqatun jariya. You either do something with the wealth Allah has blessed you with, the time, the knowledge that Allah has blessed you with. Look, the wealth is one thing. But look at the knowledge, whatever goodness Allah has blessed you with, 
Go for it, mashallah. You know, teach it. A few months ago, I was speaking to a few people and they were telling me how sometimes the sisters become a little bit uh, reluctant to share beautiful recipes with others because they don't want someone else to know their recipe. It happens. And I happened to tell them, you know what? Why don't you share the recipe such that whenever people make the dish, obviously we're talking of halal food here. Wherever, when, when people make the dish, they will make a dua for you to say, mashallah, the sisters passed away, but you know, she taught me this. May Allah grant her goodness. People will eat the, the, the dish, for example, eat from that food and they, they will remember you and perhaps they will say a good dua for you. So that reward would be connected to the way they remember you. Perhaps not by the food itself, but the way they remember you as a result of the goodness. It was something good. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and make us more generous with these type of things. So take a look at the last part of this hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu in Sahih Muslim. We said the first is Sadaqatun Jariya, that is the, the deed we are talking about, and that continues later on after a person has passed away. The second is knowledge that is benefited from after you've passed away. And sometimes that knowledge could be in the form of CDs, in the form of discs, in the form of books, in the form of uh, apps, in the form of so many other things. Trust me, that is you building your palace in the Akhirah. May Allah help us. That is you building your palace in the Akhirah. That is something you need more desperately than the vehicles of today and these houses of today and the gadgets of today. What I need more desperately than that is Jannah, it is paradise, it is when I get to the other side because as I'm walking, even if I've been able to purchase all the things of the world, the day I fall into that pit, what is it that's going to help me in the pit? I need a trampoline at the bottom firstly to cushion me, Allahu Akbar. And then I need subhanallah, uh, some goodness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How will I achieve it? So look at the last part of the hadith. The Prophet sallallahu says, وَلَدٌ صَالِحٌ يَدْعُوا لَهُ if a person has left behind progeny and children who pray for him, that will be an automatic charity that is continuing. It will continue after you've passed away. This means that for me to spend time with my children is already an investment for the Akhirah. For me to spend quality time with them, guide them, it is my duty such that the day I die, if they remember me with goodness and say, Oh Allah, forgive my father, that is a good enough dua to help me and to benefit me after I've died. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So spend much time with your children, with your family. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. We've heard this verse so many times, Surah At-Tahreem, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, you who believe, save yourselves and your family members from the fire. How would I be able to do that if I'm never at home? If I don't spend time with them, if I don't show a keen interest in the schooling of my children, if I'm not with my wife, if the domestic situation is such at home that I don't even want to be there, nor does my spouse or children want to be in the presence of any one of us. May Allah protect us, may He help us. Really, we need to work on it and work hard. That is your paradise, that is your Jannah, such that by the will of Allah, the day you die, at least they will miss you and they will say, Oh Allah, forgive him. Just that dua, Oh Allah, forgive him. Just that dua is considered so high and lofty in the eyes of Allah. My beloved brothers and sisters, pray for your parents and grandparents who've passed away and understand the day you pass away, if you've taught your children correctly, they will pray for you. Trust me, the benefit of it is so great that only Allah knows He would not have made mention of it if it was not beneficial. So this is something really great to invest in your children and in their good character and conduct and their decent upbringing is something that will really result in your goodness and earning Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that to us. Here we are. We've heard the beautiful hadith, the hadith connected to the sadaqa jariya, the hadith connected to charities that will flow and continue even after I've passed away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it beneficial for myself. May He make me and yourselves as well from amongst those who can choose wisely when we want to give out a charity. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. My brothers and sisters, as we have just seen, if we are to utilize our wealth in a way and our time and energy and effort and whatever Allah has blessed us with in a way that others benefit, we will be reaping the benefit later on. Take a look at these deeds. The deeds we spoke about this today, 
they are mostly connected to the benefit that is received or achieved by others as a result of a deed that we have done. And Allah says, that is beneficial for you. It goes to show that when we reach out to fellow human beings, we have fulfilled part of the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there are two major issues that we need to understand. One is the right of Allah, the right of Allah over us. And we need to fulfill that. It is known as Hukukullah. I fulfill my salah. It's the right of Allah. I abstain from sin. It's the right of Allah. I abstain from that which displeases Allah. It's the right of Allah. I engage in uh, Hajj. For example, I go for Hajj. I, I am fasting in the month of Ramadan. I, I give out, uh, you know, a small charity directly to a poor person. For example, these are the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I have fulfilled. Some of them may be slightly connected to a, a human being such as Zakah, for example. I, it's impossible to fulfill Zakah if we did not have the poor. And one narration says there will come a time close to the end of time when everyone will be wealthy. There will be no one to accept your charities. So let's give the charities whilst we still have people who are poor. This is why a Muslim should look at a poor person as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them. Yet the poor person will continue to want to try and achieve more. That is within the means that Allah has blessed them with and the capacity. It is something that will definitely happen. However, for us, we should look at it such that if they were not there, where would we have had the opportunity to be charitable? Allah has favored some people above others. Allah has raised some people above others in terms of wealth in order to see how they reach out to fellow human beings. Is this person not a human being? Yes, they are. Even if they are non-Muslim, to reach out to them in specific ways, humanitarian ways, to reach out to them is extremely important. They are human beings. After all, they will see the goodness of Islam. They will see that Islam reaches out to all of humanity. And this is what will soften their hearts if Allah wills for them. And this is what will bring them to the deen. How many of us seated here generations back or even amongst us, we were not Muslimin. And some time back, something good happened in our lives. And we happened to turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of the times it's connected to the way the Muslims have treated you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May Allah open our doors. May Allah grant us goodness and ease. My brothers and sisters, a beautiful blessed day. Let us make an intention that on a daily basis we will engage in charitable deeds and we will try to do good. And this is why do not unnecessarily cut off a tree that is providing shade or fruit to someone, to an animal or a bird or a human being. Don't unnecessarily cut it. If there is need, yes, you may cut it off. You'd like to build a road, you'd like to build a building, there is some purpose for that. Bismillah, you may cut it off. But just because it is not pleasing to your own eye, perhaps that might just be the Jannah of someone and perhaps it will be yours as well because if you've left it there, when you had the capacity to remove it, you will also get a reward for having left it there. May Allah bless us all. The topic is vast as you can see. But today, what, what we've done, we've just given you the gist of it, a little summary of this particular topic with some examples and you can go ahead and inshallah think up many more examples like we said at the beginning, ask the experts and you will be able to achieve. Let us improve on our character so that at least our children will take that character from us. Let us inshallah improve in every single way. Look, Allah has blessed us with health. Allah has blessed us with wealth. Allah has blessed us with Iman. Allah has blessed us with some knowledge. Allah has blessed us with time. All these need to be utilized in a way that the benefit of it is maximized. Because when I am going to meet with Allah, I don't know. And I need to prepare my abode in Jannah. And so do you. Do you know? And I will end on this. On the day of judgment, as the reckoning is being taken, each person will be worried about himself, no one else. So in this world, I'm worried about what will my son do the next 20 years? He might live for 40 years. I need to set him up. I need to do this. Mashallah, these are valid concerns. We are not saying they are wrong. But on that day, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مِّنْهُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ شَأْنٌ on that day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, a man will run away from his brothers. He will run away from his companions. He will run away from his spouse, from his children. He will run away from all those who were close to him. 
each person will be worried only and solely about himself or herself. That's what the Quran says. We will all have our own worry on the day of judgment. Hey, am I going to go into paradise? I've done this and this and this. And what's going to happen? We won't even have time to worry and to think about our spouses and our others. Nothing, no time, no space. Each one is nafsi, nafsi, myself, myself. I'm so worried, I'm so worried. Running from pillar to post, trying to save your name and trying to be given entry into Jannah. But there is good news for a believer. Start preparing from now. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you that through His mercy. Allah is the most merciful. Worship Allah alone. Try your best to adopt the sunnah of Muhammad. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as he taught try to follow and inshallah by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he will look at us all with the eyes of mercy may Allah gather us all in Jannah aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'ir al-muslimin fa astaghfiruhu innahu jawadun kareem